First you separate, and then you integrate Just follow these steps, and you will do great First you separate, and then you integrate Just follow these steps, and you will do great First you separate, and then you integrate Just follow these steps, and you will do great Here's the season to be serving When I was solving equations, I was feeling amazing Greetings Free Calculus students, welcome to lesson 11 uh, Today we're continuing we're continuing our journey with limits and we're going to find limits analytically or limits algebraically. And so far in the two methods we use to find limits graphically, numerically, it basically was just, you kind of look at it and figure it out. Well, when you find limits analytically or algebraically, uh, there's some work involved. So a little work involved today. So let's go ahead and get right to it. All right. And the main type of limits uh, we're going to find analytically uh, in pre-cal, are going to be rational functions, rational functions of polynomials. Basically, when you get to calculus, we'll get a little more extravagant, but for pre-cal, pretty much rational functions. So our typical problem is going to look something like this. Oh, I shouldn't write. I'm sorry. No need to write f of x equals. I really, I want to find the limit of some function f of x. So the limit of say x squared plus 3x plus 2 over x squared minus 1 and we'll find the limit as x goes to negative 1. All right, so the deal with finding limits it's all going to go down to a very elementary operation you learned in an earlier algebra class, namely algebra one. And the key for finding these limits analytically, the key skill is to factor. That's all you have to be able to do is to factor and you'll be able to find these limits. So the key skill to do to find these limits is to factor. So you have to be very proficient at factoring. If you are not proficient at factoring, you need to work at becoming proficient at factoring. You need to be a factoring expert, not just for this, but for a lot of things you see in higher levels of mathematics. So if you're not very good at factoring, that's something you're gonna have to get better at this year. All right, so I wanna remind you the type of factoring you use for quadratics such as this. Well, uh, before I get to that, I actually I should go through the whole process. So when I find limits like this from an analytical standpoint, the first thing I try to do is plug the number in for X. Uh, we call that direct substitution because when you have a function like this, that's polynomials, which is really all you guys will see this year. If I can plug this number in for X and get an answer back, uh, that number is going to be the limit. Now, if I plug this number in for X and get an undefined number, and you know, an undefined number means my denominator is going to be zero, there still is perhaps chance that I can find a limit. It depends the form of that undefined uh, number. So the first thing I want to do to find this limit, and I'll be honest with you, um, the problems you're going to see rarely is just plugging this number in going to render an answer. But you still want to plug it in anyway, because plugging it in, even though it's going to come to be undefined, the type of form of undefined it is will tell you if you have to do anything else or if you can just stop right there. All right. So I'm going to plug in negative one for X and see what happens. So this is negative one squared plus three times negative one plus two. That's what I have on the top. On the bottom, I have negative one squared minus one. OK, let's see what happens. So this is positive one minus three, that's negative two plus two, that's zero. Oh, that's unfortunate. And this is positive one minus one, that's zero. Okay, that's zero over zero, that is undefined. It's a, it's a nice undefined though. We call this the indeterminate. So the indeterminate form now this is good news. Well, maybe it's not good news because we were hoping that this would render us the answer. It didn't. It gave us something that was undefined. 
But however, when you plug a number in, you get zero over zero, this indeterminate form, <clears throat> that's an indication, a signal, an illustration of hope. That means there's a very good chance that this limit exists, a very good chance that this limit exists. And so when, when I get zero over zero, then I'll go into factoring and simplifying. If I get a non-zero number over zero, like if I got eight over zero, I would just stop. The limit wouldn't exist. But zero over zero, there's a very good chance that the limit will exist. And, and I'll explain why, why that's the case. But here, there's a very good chance that the limit exists. So I'm gonna go ahead and factor. And as I factor my numerator, uh, I should get x plus two times x plus one. As I factor my denominator, I should get x plus one times x minus one. And again, one hopes that you're familiar with this type of factoring. Uh, I'll briefly review it. Uh, this is not something I need to go in at length in, in a pre-cal class, but you know, if you really need help on this, I can help you out on virtual hours or something else, but I'm not gonna spend time in this lecture going over uh, the, the fundamentals of factoring stuff like this, which you should know. But what I'm basically doing, these two numbers here, they should multiply to give me this number and add to give me that number. This guy down here is called the difference of squares. So I just take the square root of each of these numbers and one's plus and one is minus. All right, but anyway, so after I factor, I cross out common factors and simplify. So this is x plus two over x minus one. And once it's simplified, I try to plug the number back in for x. So if I'm able to plug the number back in and get a real number, that number is actually the answer. So let's see what happens if I plug in negative one for x. This is negative one plus two over negative one minus one. This is one over negative two or negative one half. I got a real number. That number is the answer. So when you're able to simplify and plug the number in and get a real answer, that answer is the value of your limit. So again, to review our steps, the first thing we wanna do, even though it's generally not gonna be successful, but it's gonna give us very good information, the first thing we like to do is just plug the number in for X. If I get this zero over zero, I get happy and excited and then I proceed to factor and try to simplify. Now it is quite possible, and I'm probably not gonna do this example with you today. I may throw it in there tomorrow. It is possible to get zero over zero and the limit still not exist. That's a special case that we'll, we'll go over at a later date. I'm not gonna go over that today. But if I get a non-zero constant over zero, seven over zero, eight over zero, negative one over zero. There's no hope and you can stop there. The limit is not going, going to exist. Okay, and, and time permitting, I'll kind of explain why uh, that occurs. Okay, so let's just uh, do some examples, find these limits, we'll follow these steps. So let's take the limit as X goes to two of x squared plus 5x plus 4 over x squared plus 5x x squared minus 5x please forgive me minus 5x plus 6. all right i'm gonna try to find the limit of this guy now again the first thing i want to do I know many people just want to go straight to the factor and I don't want to factor just yet. The first thing I want to do is plug this number in for X it tells me uh, what I'm working with. So I have two squared plus five times two plus four over two squared minus five times two plus six. So let's see in the numerator, uh, we have four, that's 10, that's 14, that's 18. Oh, maybe we'll get a regular answer. In our denominator, we got four minus 10, that's negative six plus six. Oh man, that's zero. I have a non-zero number over zero. There is no need to do anything further. This is D and E. 
if you get zero over zero when you plug the number in, try to factor and solve. If you get a non-zero number over zero, you're done. You can stop there. There's nothing else you can do. The limit is not going to exist. There's no way the limit is not is going to exist. Now, you may say, why? Why is that the case? So let me try to explain why zero over zero is good and a non-zero number over zero is bad. So when I have a problem like this and I plug the number in and I get zero over zero, the main thing that's making this bad is the fact that my denominator is zero. That's, which, that's what's making it undefined, that my denominator is zero. The numerator being zero really doesn't mean much, but the fact that it's zero over zero tells me that the value of X here that's making my denominator zero, this tells me there's the same factor in the numerator that's making that denominator zero. That's how I got zero over zero. So that alerts me to the fact that there's gonna be a same factor. Again, negative one is making my denominator zero. And so if I got a zero at the top, then there should be another factor that negative one will make zero, which means it will allow me to remove that guy, remove that number that's making my denominator zero because there's one in the numerator and then very good chance I can solve the problem. Now, on the other hand, when I get a non-zero number over zero, what that's telling me is the factor that's making my denominator zero is only in my denominator. It's not in my numerator because if it was, it would be zero up here. So therefore, there's no way for me to remove that that factor. And so that's why there's no use. I mean, if you look at it, and we, we can factor we can factor this guy real quick to show you uh, the numerator is x plus four times x plus one and the denominator is x minus three times x minus two so you can clearly see there's no common factors there obviously because if two is making my denominator zero and my numerator in two is not making my numerator zero, there's no way I can have this common factor. So that's the reason behind zero over zero being good and a non-zero number over zero uh, being, yes, you guessed it, bad. All right, let's do a few more examples. So let's take the limit as X goes to say, have I went to a negative number yet? Yeah, I did the first one. So let's go back to a negative. As x goes to negative 5 of x squared minus 25 over x plus 5. All right, so this is the part where you should be becoming a little more familiar with this process. So on these problems, now I would like you to pause the video and try to find the answer before you see me work work it out. So there's only so much you can learn by just watching me do. Uh, I mean, we learn uh, by doing. Now, of course, I have to set this up and show you some examples to give you the hang of it. But now I think you've seen enough where you can start trying to solve these on your own. So I would like you to pause the video right now and then try to do the problem on your own. And then when you come back, I'll work it out and we'll see if our answers agree. All right, so let's go ahead and factor, I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and plug in negative five for X and see what happens. So this is negative five squared minus 25 over negative five plus five. So negative five squared is positive 25 minus 25 is zero. Negative five plus five is zero. I got zero over zero. That means I have hopes and aspirations. So Let's go ahead and factor and see what happens. So again, this difference of squares here. So this is X plus five times X minus five. You can't factor your denominator, but it's a common factor with this guy. So you're left with X minus five. And so you're gonna take the limit as X goes to negative five of x minus five essentially 
uh, which means you just plug in negative five for X. This is negative five minus five, it's negative 10. So the answer is negative 10. And by the way, so when I'm able to remove this guy like this and find the limit, uh, that's the indication of a removable discontinuity. Um, in fact, if you look at this function, so if you look at this function and this function, they're practically the same. So I'm, I could ask you, what do you think the graph of this looks like? And you, you may not know. Well, the graph of this looks exactly like the graph of this. It's a straight line. I guarantee you, you don't believe me, plug this into the calculator and you're gonna see this graph. You're gonna see a line with a slope of one and a y-intercept at negative five. So again, if you don't believe me, go ahead and plug it in. Now, why? The fact that the only difference between this guy and this guy is that the factor of x plus five was removed means these two functions agree for all numbers in the universe except for when x is negative five. That's the only point they don't agree on because for this function, when x is negative five, we get negative 10. But for this function, when x is negative five, it's undefined. In fact, if I was to graph this function, so I'm gonna graph it right before your very eyes. Y-intercept is at negative five, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the the x-intercept is at positive five, one, two, three, four, five. So there's a line there, there's a line there. And where is where are we taking this limit to? Negative five. So negative five is is that's where the good stuff is happening. One, two, three, four, five. And it happens around negative 10. Say that's negative 10 there. So if I graph and I'm, I'm graphing, oh, I can't even see this. <clears throat> so I'm graphing this guy right here. This is how the graph of this function looks. So we have a straight line. And once we get to negative five, when the y value is negative 10, it's undefined. And then the rest of the graph is defined. So when you're able to remove this piece like this, that's causing the problems and excuse me, remove this piece that's causing the problems and it's causing problems because it's making my denominator zero. If I can remove it, you know, it, it gives me a removable discontinuity like this. So this is exactly the same as the graph this function is exactly the same as the graph of x plus five, except at this particular point, because at this particular point, uh, this function is undefined. But you can see how, well, you can see why the limit of this function is exactly the same as the limit of this function, because as x goes to negative five, they're approaching the same value. Remember, when we find the limits from a graph, we don't care if we have an open or closed circle. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to us. As long as it's coming to the same values, uh, we're all good. Okay, let's do one more example. All right, so let's take the limit as X goes to four of now let's see x squared plus 2x minus 24 over x squared minus 36. And when you write limits, you can you can write them like this. Uh, you don't have to put them in parentheses. I tend to put them in parentheses, but it's not a requirement. So this one I'm just going to leave like this. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in 4 for x and see what happens. So this will be 4 squared plus 2 times 4 minus 24 over 4 squared minus 36. So let's see what occurs. So here we have 16 and eight, that's 24. 24 minus 24 is zero. Uh, are we gonna get zero over zero? 
No, this is 16 minus 36 is negative 20. So this is zero over negative 20. Zero over negative 20 is zero. That's a defined number. So this limit is zero. So again, if I can plug the number in and get a real answer, that answer is the limit. Now again, all the problems are when my denominator is zero. If just my numerator is zero, we're all good because zero over a non-zero number is equal to zero. It's when you have a number over zero when it's undefined. So this one is all good. So a lot of people do a problem like this. They come out and see the zero on top and think it's undefined, uh, but it's, it's not. You know, zero over a non-zero number is zero. Okay, that completes our lesson today on finding limits analytically. Again, the key skill is to factor. Uh, once again, you wanna plug the number in for X first. It's suggested. There are a lot of people that just go straight to the factoring. And if you wanna do that, that's fine as well. But it's, it's recommended that you plug the number in for X first. And if you get zero over zero, try to factor and solve. And if you get a non-zero number over zero, just write D and E. And if you get a regular number, uh, that regular number is, an answer, is the answer. So that concludes our lesson and we'll see you next time.